So, um, how hard can it be to love one another? I think a little children just sort of instinctively know about this. And then somehow, as you move from being three to being 30 or something, it gets beaten out of you somehow. Little children, they do this sort of stuff all the time. They just love each other. So in this passage that I just uh, read you, this passage is an important passage because it's part of this flow of this story, this dying death, resurrection, new life story. And um, the point of the passage is to talk about what is this new life or abundant life, eternal life. What does it look like? And what does Jesus have to do with it? Those, so those two questions, what's this new life look like? What does Jesus have to do with it? And then I had that passage that I just read to you. Now, on Friday, Fridays I uh, like to meet in the mornings with a colleague of mine, whose name's Arnold, who's a United Methodist pastor, but is also, in my opinion, certifiably brilliant. He's one of those people, I just feel so blessed to be able to meet with this guy. We read Hebrew Bible together, and um, he's just, he's sort of out there somewhere. You know, he, he, the Hebrew Bible is about this thick in Hebrew. And I'm not even sure Arnold owns a dictionary, because he just knows. Same with the New Testament in Greek, he just knows. And same with Akkadian and Ugaritic and everything else. He's just this huge source of knowledge. Anyway, Arnold is preaching from the lectionary, which is what we're doing. This is the lectionary John text for this week. And when I went in, I said, so, um, what are you, are you going to be using the gospel text? And he went, oh, so John 15. And he went, oh. And I said, I know, it's like the most complicated thing in the world. He said, yeah. he said as far as I can tell, there's only two, two possibilities. One is you stand up and you, you say to the congregation, love one another. And then you go and sit down and just call it a day. He said, and that's okay, that's fine to do that. Or, he said, you've got to find out what it is that Jesus is really talking about here. And he said, and that's complicated, isn't it? And I said, yes, it is. So I decided to go for the complicated one here. So if you want the, uh, Jesus says you should love each other, just take a little nap, you'll be fine. That's an important message, and Jesus really did say it, that we should love one another. Um, the passage for today... It has the word love in it eight times, and uh, fortunately for us, it, it's the same Greek word each one of the eight times. So we know that there are lots and lots of different Greek words for love, right? So agapeo, which I usually say means something like to love like God loves, and phileo, to love like your brother loves you, brotherly love, hence Philadelphia, right? Or there's words for erotic love and all sorts of other things. This one... It's the same word in all eight, so we don't have to worry about different nuances between words or whether John knew the difference between them, which I would assert he did not, that he used uh, agapeo and filio interchangeably. We don't have to worry about any of that because it's the same word all the way through. So that's good. But there's this verse, verse 12. It's a very popular verse in... Christian churches, lots and lots of people know this verse. It's not quite up there with John 3.16, but it's close. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Well, what's complicated about that, right? It sounds like uh, Jesus is giving a commandment, is commanding his disciples to love each other the same way that Jesus loves them, right? That's what it looks like so that's nice except just a few verses later it says this I am giving you these commands so that you may love one another loving one another isn't one of the commands he's giving some commands so that you love one another loving one another is the fruit that comes from the commands so at least that's what it sounds like here. So if you put them next to each other, what you notice is one of them says, this is my commandment that you love one another. And the other one says, I'm giving you these commands so that 
you may love one another. Now, in Greek, it's the same word translated once as that and once as so that. It's a little three-letter word, ina, in Greek. Now, for those of you who think, oh, I'm not interested in the meaning of tiny little words, some of us are old enough to remember a time when a United States president, his, his ability to stay in office focused on the meaning of one tiny little word. Do you remember some Clinton? Did the, yes? Few people are nodding. It was one tiny word. And what does it mean and how do you use it? And the whole presidency swung on this. Well, in a similar way, the whole message of Jesus swings on this, and it really does. Yeah. Now, if you were to go look that up somewhere, like um, one of the best-known uh, dictionaries of the New Testament, Kittel's Theological Dictionary of the New Testament, it has ten pages, ten pages of tiny text on this one little three-letter word. And it turns out that different authors, as one might expect, use this tiny little word differently. John uses it to denote purpose. So John will use it, for example, uh, he'll have Jesus say, I told you this so that you do that. There's a purpose to him telling you. It's not just that you hear it, but that you do it. So I told you this so that you will do that. Those are called purpose clauses. And John likes to use this word in what are called theological purpose clauses and ethical purpose clauses. Those are his two uses. If there's a purpose, it's so that, or we might say, in order that. And um, so if we go back to those two verses and we translate the little Greek word the same way in both verses, this is my command, says Jesus, referencing something. We're not sure what yet. He's referencing something. This thing is my command. So that you love one another as I've loved you. Now it fits in with verse 17, which says, I'm giving you these commands, these ones over here, that I haven't, we haven't figured out what they are yet, so that you may love one another. It's the purpose of the commands. It's a purpose statement, and that's how John uses this word. So the purpose of the commands is that we love each other, but loving each other isn't one of the commands. So... Um, you can see the difference in the different ways people have struggled to render this. The New Revised Standard Version, which we typically use when we're reading Scripture, that's verse 17. I'm giving you these commands so that you may love one another. The NIV, in what must take the prize, is one of the most hideous translations uh, I've ever seen, says, this is my commandment, colon, love each other. There's no, they've translated the word so that in a, with a colon. They've translated a word as a punctuation mark, which if you've ever done any translating work, you'll know, you can't do that. That's just not, a, that's not good. But just look at these two for a minute. I'm giving you these commands so you may love one another versus this is my command, love one another. There's, um, there's a book by a guy called Mark Davis who... Um, his best-known book, I put the title up there because I thought you'd like it, Those, he wrote a book called Left Behind and Loving It, which is like a spoof on the LaHaye Jenkins thing. Um, now, this quote is not from that book. It's from one of his papers. But um, his paper says, do you see the difference? Love one another is not the command itself. It's the purpose of the things that Jesus commands. Jesus commanded these things so that they would love one another. And so the real question, the question becomes, what does Jesus mean by these things or these commandments? I give you these commandments so that you can love one another. They're like the engine that drives love. So um, now you can, you can add some clarifying information by keeping on reading. Verse 10 says, if you keep my commandments, you'll abide in my love. So... If we know that the purpose of the commandments is that we love one another, now we know we can add to that and live within or abide in the love of Christ. We can add that extra bit of information. And then the next verse says, I've said these things to you so that, same word, my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. So we can add a bit more. The purpose of the commandments is that we love each other and live within the love of Christ as a joyous experience. 
This is usually shocking news to people that Christianity is supposed to be a joyous experience. You know, it's not supposed to make you miserable as sin, as they say. It's supposed to be a happy, joyous, transformational thing. And that's what it looks like. Now, um, where is all this taking place? Because that helps us figure out what Jesus is talking about. This is taking place in the room where Jesus has just washed the feet of the disciples. And the passage in John that's divided up over many weeks in the lectionary, if you just sat down and read it all in one go, you'd realize that Jesus said these words that I just read out to you within minutes of washing the feet of the disciples. I figure it could be as short a time as five minutes, if, or, or if you speak slowly, it might be ten. But it's right there. He washes their feet, then he says all of this stuff about love. And um, the words, I think, are intended to illuminate these actions. So, when Jesus describes the foot washing, he says this. Do you know what I've done to you? Do you? You call me teacher and Lord, and yeah, you're right, for that's what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you also should do as I have done to you. And then in today's passage, if we put down verse 12, parallel to the end of uh, that little passage about foot washing, I've set you an example that you also should do as I've done to you. This is my commandment. This, that you should follow this example, is the commandment in order or so that you love one another as I've loved you. The foot washing thing is set up as the example that powers love and the commandments are in reference to foot washing. Now, not literally getting down and washing each other's feet, although we could do that. In my experience, people in congregations don't like it very much because you know, they worry whether they have good socks on and things like this. So, but th th it's an idea more than an actual practice. So Mark Davis in his book says that love is not the command itself, but the fruits of and final purpose for keeping the commands. So those commands exemplified by Jesus washing the feet of the disciples, what's that mean? Well, that's Jesus, who they've just referred to as Lord, undertaking a task that's reserved for slaves, right? In Jesus' day, if you went to visit a rich person, by the time you got there, you'd have your sandals on, trekking through the, the sand and the dirt, your feet would be filthy, you'd go in, a slave would come out with water and a towel, and they would wash your feet for you. It's something slaves do to masters and lords and owners. So, um, Jesus is referencing a social structure that looks like this on the left, where there's a group of people up at the top, the lords and the masters and the owners, and there's a group of people at the bottom. And the people at the bottom were believed to have less inherent worth than the people at the top. Really, you could buy them. They had price tags on them. They were slaves. Uh, and a slave at this time, in, under Roman law, is simply a human tool, like a, a shovel. You go down to the market, you buy a new shovel. If you break it, you just go buy another one, throw the, throw the old one away. Same with slaves. You go to the market, you buy one, you bring it home. If you break it, you throw it away and go buy another one. The people had no innate, inherent value in this old empire-based system. Lords, they had all the value. Slaves, they had none. Jesus comes along and says, mm, just a minute, I'm going to wash your feet. I'm going to act like a slave towards you, even though you called me Lord. So he's taking the idea of Lord and slave and putting them next to each other. Usually the slave would wash the Lord's feet, and now the Lord is going to wash the slave's feet. He's put them as next to each other like that. This is what this new life is, is about. It's about an equalizing and a removal of this uh, sort of hegemony or this hierarchy of power. And um, Jesus, in fact, says this almost in, this, uh, in the words that I read to you. I'm not going to call you servants. This was slaves is the same word, slaves. I'm not going to call you slaves anymore. 
slave doesn't know what's going on and so on and so forth. I'm going to call you friends. So we could, in fact, relabel that picture. Jesus says it used to look like this. There were people up at the top with all the power and the agency and so on, people at the bottom with none of that. I'm going to reorder this, but we're not even going to use the same words. From now on, it's going to be friends. That's how we're going to look at it. And when we do that, that's what empowers one person to be able to love another. I think this is really true because if you've ever been in a relationship with somebody, not necessarily you know, a personal type of relationship, maybe at work or at school or something, but it could be a personal one, in which the person saw themselves as being up here and you as being down there, it's hard to imagine something that you could describe as authentic love being practiced in that situation, don't you think? I think actually it's impossible. I don't think it can be done. If I believe my inherent absolute worth is this much and yours is that much, the idea that we love each other is, I mean, it doesn't make any sense. It can't be. So Jesus says, in order for you to be able to love each other, you're going to have to restructure your thinking. You're going to have to see the world like this and not like this. That's what's going on in this passage. It's really important, I think. So it works like this. What does new life look like? You have to restructure your way of thinking about the world. So it looks like uh, equality between people um, without these great big power and authority hierarchies. And that's what drives love. The first part is the commandment. The second part is the fruit of keeping the commandment. So that means we have serious work to do, right? It's not like Jesus walks in and just says, love each other. You're on your own to figure out how to do that. What Jesus says is, we need to stop thinking in terms of these hierarchical structures that deny inherent worth to people, like slaves. Why would he say that? Because I think Jesus really believed that we are made in the image of God. And if you're made in the image of God and I'm made in the image of God, then our inherent worth is the same so it's really important about social social order and social structure what he's saying here now it's a way of looking at the world so what do you see when you look at a picture like this i'm not really going to comment on it i'll just let you look at it for a second slightly strange picture but what do you see see if you see this the the one half of the picture was clearly somebody who was rich and had smartly pressed pants and nice black shoes which i I'm embarrassed to notice we're identical to the ones that I'm wearing. So there's that. And then on the other side was the scruffy, torn up pants and so on. If, you th- if your first reaction is, this one has all of the money and power and this one has nothing, so this one's worth more than that one, and you see it like that, then Jesus would say, no, 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 no. You need to do some reordering of your thinking here. Those two legs belong to the same person, of course, in the picture, don't they? So he's saying, look, no, 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 it's got to be like this. They've got to be level with each other. The fact that one's wearing dirty old sandals and the other one's wearing smartly polished shoes has got nothing to do with anything. Both of those legs were made in the image of God, if God has legs. So do you see that? That's the idea. Now, this, this, uh, this idea of uh, hierarchies of inherent worth is so embedded in in our lives. I took this little quote from a book by a guy called Art Kleiner. It's called Who Really Matters? And then there's a great big long subtitle I didn't put on. It's not a theology book. It's got nothing to do with, this guy's not a religious person. This is a book. Um, Art Kleiner writes about uh, how businesses are structured, how corporations are structured, and how corporations deal with, say, change structurally. That's what he writes about. You know, like in the days when suddenly telephones that you put your finger in and dialed went away, and smartphones appeared in a very short period of time. If you were a company that made phones, you better be reacting like this, right? And part of his conversation, as you can see, says, that in uh, corporate structures, what happens is you have a core group. Those would be the people at the top here. 
and they send a message through the system and out into the world. And the message is that, it's, as he says, it's not just all right, but it's mandatory to treat some people as innately worth more than others. It's mandatory. And you can see this when, if you, perhaps if you think of a corporation, you know, a famous one with a CEO whose name you know, who maybe had a salary last year of 15 million and then uh, all sorts of uh, bonuses and stuff for another 25 million. And you think about that person and then you think about the person who cleans the toilets on the factory floor. The temptation to think about one of them as innately worth more than the other is almost overwhelming, right? It's just drummed into us. This person up here's got this one's down, there's nothing. It's just pushed onto us all the time. Uh, same with, say, when you watch a, maybe when you watch a movie. There's one group of people who are called the stars of the movie. And then there's the extras. And these people are obviously worth more than those people. I'm not talking about necessarily in terms of money, but people idolize the one group and they don't even notice the other group. They think one group is innately worth more than the other group. And this is what Jesus is talking about in this passage, that that way of thinking about things buys into the hierarchical structure that we refer, we've referred to as the empire, where you have an emperor at the top and a slave at the bottom, and that's what the system looks like. And Jesus objects to that strenuously because he sees the world more like this, that it doesn't really matter who you are, that you're equal to each other in terms of your innate worth. You are made in the image of God. You're equals to each other. And only when we see the world this way, when we train ourselves to see the world this way, does it become possible for one person to love another. Assuming you agree with my hypothesis that somebody up here and somebody down there, if they're in a relationship, that a love that means anything just can't work that way. It just can't. So, um, it's only this way, once we set the scales, that the fruit of the commandment, which is love, can become possible. And only when love becomes possible can love win. And that's what the new life, the new birth, the resurrected life is supposed to look like. So I think it means we've got some work to do. Because, you know, I'm being honest with you when I say these, those ideas are so prevalent in society that unless I really concentrate on it, I might just see the one person as worth more than another because it's battered into me on the television and the internet and in the newspapers. And I know it's a lie, but if I just slip up, I'll buy into it just for a second. So um, that battle is real, and that's what Jesus is commanding us about. Let's see the world the way that Jesus does, because then love will become possible, and then love can win. It's, uh, I think, hard but I also remember it's one of the few things where Jesus commands his followers to do it. It's not a suggestion. Jesus doesn't suggest that we see the world this way. He says, you must see the world this way. You must, because otherwise you can't love your neighbor. You can't love the stranger. You can't love your enemy. And the empire wins. And that... We can't let that happen. That's what the new life is, is a world that looks like this. The fruit of the commandment, love wins. So we have work to do, brothers and sisters, to bring about a world that looks like this.